Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. And in the current module, we are discussing about the different types of host, what is available for the protein production and how you can be able to utilize these host in the, for the protein production. Uh, and so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, prokaryotic uh, expression system. So where we have discussed about how you can be able to transform the bacterial cells uh, with the help of the different types of vectors. And then we have also discussed about the uh, how you can be able to induce those cells and then you can collect, break open and then how you can be able to analyze the protein production with the help of the SDS page. In the subsequent to that, in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the yeast and as well as the insect cell line as an expression system. And we have discussed uh, uh, about the protocols and the procedures what you have to follow to uh, express the protein into some of these expression system. Now, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the mammalian system as an expression system. So let's start the lecture today. So mammalian expression system, as the name suggests, it is actually going to utilize the different types of mammalian cells for the protein production. So similar to the other uh, expression system, the protein production in the mammalian expression system can be achieved with either from a vector present in the extra chromosomal DNA, which is going to be a transient expression, or the sequence is integrated into the genome through the homologous recombinations to establish the permanent cell lines. The expression from the transient or the permanent cell line can be from the constituted or the inducible promoter. Just like as we have discussed about the yeast expression system, here also you can have the choice of either you want the constitutive expression or the inducible expressions. Irrespective of the expression mode in the mammalian system, the different the basic topics need to produce the protein are as follows. In the step one, you are going to clone the foreign gene in the mammalian expression vector. In the step two, you are going to transfect the cell line with a recombinant construct. In the step three, you are going to screen and select the transformed cells. In the step four, you are going to culture the transfected cells. And in the step five, you are going to do the protein production. If it is a inducible expression system, you are going to add the inducer. If it is a constitutive expression system, then you are going to culture the cells for several generation and it, the expression is going to be uh, correlated to the uh, amount of protein what you are going to express. So uh, these are the some of the cell lines what you are going to use. You can use the MCF7, HT1080, EH927 and you can use the macrophage cell line GA774. And all of these uh, cell lines have their own origins so you can actually be able to use the cells as per the origin of the protein as well. For example, you if you are trying to express an enzyme which is mostly being found in the kidney, then in that case you should use the CB1 cells. Okay. Similarly, you can use the cells like fibroblast cells uh, for protein production or the enzyme production where you can use the COS7 or uh, NIH33 cells. Uh, then you can use the J774, A.1 which are actually the macrophage cell lines. And then you can use the CHO uh, K1, which is actually uh, ovarian cell lines, and HeLa BHK1 and HEK293. And HEK293 is a uh, kidney cells. So depending on the uh, the source of the enzyme, you can actually be able to choose the different options. And uh, sometimes the uh, the rate of the these cells and as well as the maintenance is also another parameter. What you can also be keep into the considerations. Uh, mammalian expression system, uh, you can actually have the two options, either you can have the transient expressions or you can have the permanent expressions. In the transient expression, the expression is high but for the short period of time because the vector is not going to integrate the DNA into the genome, so it is actually going to be remain as the extra chromosomal DNA. So the cells transfected with DNA expresses the protein until the 72 hour post transfections. Transient expression system is used for screening the cDNA libraries, isolation of a particular cDNA uh, clone expressing surface antigen and to test the 
applicability of the recombinant transcript going to use for the permanent trans, uh, expression. So, transcript expression is mostly being used to test that your construct is correct or not. Then you can have the permanent expression. The permanent expression of a gene is possible if it will be integrated into the chromosomal DNA. The most crucial step to establish a permanent expression system for a gene is the frequency of integration events rather than the number of gene uptake. In simpler words, the permanent transfection depends on the uh, recombination frequency instead of the uh, transfection efficiency. So, uh, transient expression system. So, the expression is very high, but for the short period of time, the cells transfected with the DNA expresses protein until the 72 hour post transaction. So, how you are going to do the transient transactions? You can have the multiple steps. So, there are multiple steps required for the transiently express a protein in COS7 cell line. So, I have taken an example of the COS7 cell. The steps are as follows. In the step 1, uh, you are going to clone the foreign DNA into an appropriate mammalian expression vector to obtain the recombinant DNA. Uh, transfection efficiency is maximum for a supercoiled DNA. So, you, you can verify the recombinant DNA by a mini prep kit to prepare the high quality supercoiled DNA. And uh, in the step one, you are going to do the delivery of the, uh, you are going to do the cloning and as well as you are going to do the transaction. So, in the step one, you are going to first plate the uniform uh, cells, right? You can plate 10 to power 7 cells and you can actually be able to do the transaction. And uh, in the step two, you are going to do the screening. So, you are going to do the, uh, you know, uh, uh, transfect the cells. So, in the step one, you are going to do the screening of the cells with the help of the appropriate antibiotics. And when you do so, you are going to have the most, the death of the most of the cells except the transfected cells, right? So, for example, if you use the puromycin or other antibiotics which are going to kill the uh, non transfected cell, then you can actually be able to select these cells with the help of the uh, you know, uh, screen the cells with the help of the antibiotics. Uh, then the steps uh, four, uh, you can have the choice two choices. Either if the cells, if the expressing cell surface or intracellular protein, so you can have two choices. Either the protein is expressing on the cell surface, or it would be it is going to be an intracellular protein. So, transfected cells are allowed to express the protein for another 72 hours. You remove the media, wash the cells with PBS and detect the presence of protein on the cell surface or in the cell lysate by an activity assay or by the western blotting. That anyway we are going to discuss in the later part of this lecture, uh, how you can be able to use the western blotting to detect the proteins. But uh, what you are going to do is you are going to collect these cells uh, by the centrifugation. So, that will give you the two fractions. Either you are going to have the uh, cell fractions or the supernatant. So, if you have put the cells under the uh, secretory pathway, it is going to be in the secretory uh, into the supernatant. And if it is be uh, present in the either with the cell membrane or it with the intercellular protein, it is going to be present on the cell surface. So, in that case, you lyse the cells with the help of the appropriate lysis solution and that will actually going to release the content. So, it is going to give you two fractions. It is going to give you the pellet fractions and it is going to give you the uh, cytosolic fractions. And cytosolic fractions is going to be, uh, you know, it is going to be the soluble proteins. The pellet fraction is going to be the, uh, the cells which are actually going to be expressed on the cell surface because that is going to be membrane fractions. So, in the steps, if the cell, if, the, if you are expressing the secretory proteins, the wash the transfected cells with PBS and add the serum free media, it allows to secrete the proteins for next 72 hours, harvest the media, remove the dead cells and debris by the centrifugations and filter the media with a 0.45 micron syringe filter before storage detect the presence of the protein in media either by the activity assay or by the western blotting. The second option is, so you can also be able to do the permanent expression. So, permanent expression is the permanent expression of a gene is possible if it will be integrated into the chromosomal DNA and the permanent transfection also has the multiple steps which you have to follow. So, in the 
permanent expression you have the different steps you can have the uh, clone the foreign uh, dna into the appropriate mammalian expression factor to obtain the recombinant dna transfection efficiency is maximum for a supercoiled dna so you can verify the recombinant dna by a mini prep kit to prepare the high quality supercoiled dna okay because the transfection efficiency will actually increases the chances of the DNA to be get integrated into the genome. You seed the cells in a DMEM media supplemented with 10% FBS at 20% confluency in a uh, 100 mm dish. I'm sure uh, many of you don't know that what is mean by 20% confluency. So 20% confluency means the number of cells which are actually going to cover the 20% area of that particular dish. Then you can do the transfection. So transfect the cells with a recombinant DNA using a transfection reagents. You can use the uh, lipofectamine, you can use the BE based transfections and you can do the other methods what we have discussed in the previous lecture. Then in the step four, you're going to do the selection of the transfected cells. You can have multiple options uh, of selecting the transfected cells. Uh, you can take the small helicot of the cell and test the expression of the foreign protein with the western blotting. In addition, the integration of the genome into in integration of the gene into the genome can be checked by performing a sudden blotting with a radioactive probe derived from the gene of interest. So uh, I have not discussed about the sudden blotting, but uh, if you are interested you can actually be able to see one of my another MOOCs course where I have discussed. So this is called as experimental uh, biotechnology. And if you uh, go under the experimental biotechnology, the uh, I think the module 11 is actually going to be discussed or going to be deal with the uh, southern blotting. So you can actually be able to understand the different steps and as well as the technical details how you can be able to perform the southern blotting to check the presence of GM, G. Basically what you are doing is you are taking the genome, digesting it into the uh, different uh, with the help of the uh, suitable restriction enzyme, you are resolving it onto a agro gel, then transferring those DNA to the uh, into a nitrocellulose membrane and then you are probing that with the small uh, probe, uh, radio level probe, then that probe is going to be the corresponding sequences what you are going to, uh, you know, related to that particular gene what you have cloned. And using this you can be able to say whether the gene of your uh, uh, gene what you have cloned is actually being present in the genome or not. Uh, so that you can actually be able to follow if you are interested to uh, read more about this and blotting. Uh, so uh, this is what we are going to do. Uh, so we are going to do first the trans so first you are going to do a plating of the cells. Then you are going to do transfection with the help of the suitable transfection reagents. Uh, once you got the transfection, you are going to do the antibiotic screening. You can use the pyromycin, velnomycin. You have a lot of options of different types of antibiotics what you can use and then you are going to do the selection of the transfected cells. So in the selection of the transfected cell you are going to do the two options. For, so 48 hours after transfection the, split the transfected cell in a selection media containing antibiotic and allow, the, allow it to grow for another four days. When you do that it is actually going to kill most of the non-transfected cell, but we are going to maintain the transfected, uh, going to uh, allow the proliferation of the transfected cells. Then you are going to do is you are going to gently, you are gently wash the cells with PBS and observe the discrete colony. So what you see is you are going to see a discrete, you know, colonies of the cell, right? So these cells are not, these are transfected cells and they are, uh, you know, not going to be die with the help of even with the antibiotic because the vector is providing them the resistance. Delineate the boundary of each colony with a marker from the back side of the plate. So what you're going to do is you're going to, uh, you know, monitor your and see the plate is, uh, you know, you can be able to just put a marker and you back from the back side of the plate, you're going to say, okay, this is the colony I have, right? So from the back side of the plate, you can just put the marker. Then what you're going to do is you're going to put the you're going to, so remove the media and put the cloning rings into the each colony. So 
for example if you have this is the colony you have marked actually so you can just put a cloning ring actually cloning ring is actually a small uh, tube like structure so it's actually going to be like this okay small okay and this side is going to have a you know the glue actually so when you remove it and you keep it on this it is actually going to uh, remain sticked and then you can actually be able to do whatever you like to do with this it's going to be get isolated from the other colony for example this is also another colony you can put another colony reactions so whatever you want to do with this will not going to affect this because it's going to be sealed from the bottom so wash the colony with the pbs and add 100 microliter of chipsy edta so in this one you are going to add the chipsy edta so what will happen this colony is going to be detached from the plate surface and that you can be able to collect so wash the colony with pbs and transfer it into a 24 wheel dish allow it to grow and become anti fungal confluent so what you are going to do is you are going to take out this particular colony and transfer it into a 24 wheel dish right so that it actually should grow because you know that every cell has a tendency that it is looking for the similar type of cell in the close vicinity so if you have the 10 cm dish it is actually going to be so big that this colony will be actually not going to get the micro environment what is required for it to grow right because every cell is looking for some minor micro environment some kind of growth signal from the other colony also other cells actually so if the plate is very big this signal is going to be missing so what you're going to do is you just take put a cloning ring on this you take out this cell and put it into a small well like the 24 well so that case it's actually going to the concentration of these micro environment or the growth factors what it actually secreting is very high and that's how it's actually going to grow and it becomes confluent so it's going to grow in large quantity and it's going to be confluent okay so allow to grow and become antipunctulant, transfer the, these cells to a six well dish in the presence of selection media and allow it to grow. So what you are doing is you are actually you have taken out from this, you are first putting into 24 well dish which is actually a small area. Then you are putting it into a six well dish so it is going to be even bigger and from the six well you are going to, you can put it into 12 well or even like a large uh, well like this. Okay, so then you can transfer it onto a big dish and that's why it is actually going to grow. The other method is you can actually be able to use the flow cytometry. Okay? So take a small helicord of the cell and test the expression of foreign DNA, a foreign protein with the help of the western blotting. In addition, the integration of genome into genome can be checked by external blotting and you can also be able to do the flow cytometry. Uh, as far as the expression is concerned, within the mammalian expression system, you have the two options. You can use the constitutive expression or you can use the inducible expression. Constitutive expression is the place where you are going to use the housekeeping genes and it, uh, the protein production is going to be proportional to the cell mass. So, higher the cell mass, it is actually going to have the more number of proteins. But the the proportion of your protein will be related to the cell growth. So recovery of the protein is going to be a very difficult task when you're, you rely on the constitutive expression. Whereas in the inducible expression system, the, you can actually be able to uh, you know, use that for the expression of a toxic protein or proteins with the allotropic or non-specific effects. In the inducible expression system, you can use the TET on and TET off system. So, inducible expression system, inducible expression system is useful for the expression of a toxic protein or protein with the pleiotropic or the non-specific effects. The tetracycline control inducible system is given. In this system, seven tandemly released TET operators are placed upstream to a minimal CMB promoter and the transcriptional activator gene. In Another set, the target gene is replaced with a TTA gene. In the presence of tetracycline, the binding of TTA is blocked to the tetracycline operator. Consequently, it causes the low level of expression of TTA and the target gene. So, this is the uh, schematic diagram of explaining how the TET inducible promoter is working. 
So uh, you have actually a tent operators which actually has the tent uh, which has the uh, you know tandemly released tent operators and that has been released that has been placed upstream to the minimum GMV promoter and then you have the transcriptional activator gene. So uh, in another set the target gene is placed with the TTA gene and in the presence of tetracycline the binding of the tetracycline to this is actually going to block the uh, tetracycline operator and subsequently it is actually going to induce the expression of the TTA gene and as well as the target gene. So in the absence of tetracycline, the low level of TTA binds to the operator and drive the enhanced expression of TTA which in turn stimulate the further amplification of the initial signal and transcriptional activator dropped in the presence produced in the absence of tetracycline eventually stimulate the expression of the target gene. So this is uh, all about the uh, expression machinery what we have discussed for the protein production or the enzyme production. We have discussed about the EKLA expression system, we have discussed about the yeast expression system, insect cell line expression system and as well as lastly we have also discussed about the mammalian expression system. Irrespective of the expression system, you can be able to check the overexpression onto the SDS page. But SDS page is only going to say you that there is an overexpression of the particular molecular weight of protein, okay. Uh, but it will not going to give you the identity of this protein and this identity of this protein is very important to know that a protein of your interest is actually going to be expressed and that you are actually going to do with the help of a technique which is called as the western blotting. So uh, let's discuss about the western blotting. So western blotting can be done in a is a multiple step reactions. So what you're going to do is you're going to first, uh, you know, so in the western blotting, what you're going to do is first you're going to run the SDS page. Okay, so you're going to get the pattern of the bands onto the gel, like SDS gel. You're going to transfer that onto a nitrocellulose membrane, and uh, that pattern is going to be maintained, right? And then you are going to uh, treat it with the primary antibody. So primary antibody will go and bind to your target protein. And uh, ultimately you're going to do a washing step. So that washing is going to remove non-specifically bound protein. And it's going to remain, uh, allow the specific proteins to be bind. And then you're going to add the secondary antibodies. And secondary antibodies will go and bind to the primary antibody. And then you're going to add the substrate and that substrate is going to give you the signal. So uh, there are multiple steps what you have to follow and there is a discrete uh, recipes and protocols what you have to follow to perform the western blotting. Uh, whatever the material you require, so in this case uh, we are taking an example of E. coli which are expressing uh, GFP proteins or GFP protein site. They require the protein standard marker, you require the transfer buffer, you require the transfer membrane like the nitrocellulose membrane or the PVDF membrane, you require a plastic tray, spatula, blotting sheets, uh, electro blotting units, you require the reagent for performing the SDS page that anyway we have discussed in the previous lecture, right? You require the primary antibody which is the anti-GFP antibody and you also require the secondary antibodies and then you also require the developing reagents. So uh, in the step one, you are going to prepare the sample, right? So preparation of the sample depends on the sample type for the tissue. Like for example, solid tissue such as tumor or whole cell or brain, it is first mechanically being broken down into individual cell using the blender, homogenizer or bisonications. Once the individual cells are obtained, it will be processed as described. So first you are going to have the, you know, mechanically you can homogenize and break down the you know, tissue into individual cells. And then these, once the individual cells, individual cells are incubated with the lysis buffer containing the detergent along with the protease and phosphate buffer cocktail. Then the step two, you are going to do the electrophoresis of the sample that anyway we have discussed. Like samples are resolved onto the SCS page as we discussed previously. Then the step three, you're going to do the transfer of the gel onto the blotting membrane. So that is a very, very important and crucial event because the how good you are doing the transfer, that actually is going to tell you, the, uh, that is actually going to decide the quality of the um, Western blot. 
So first you have to prepare the transfer membrane. So cut the membrane of the same size as gel and then you are going to have these events. For nitrocellulose membrane, the, place the membrane in the transfer buffer and observe that the liquids are has wicked the membrane. Areas appeared at white spot needs white, uh, special considerations. Then for the PVDF membrane, the immerse the membrane into 100% methanol for 15 to 30 minutes, decant the methanol and submerge the membrane into a transfer buffer for additional 10. 30 minutes. So for the PVDF membrane, you are actually going to have a charging step. Charging step means where uh, you are going to treat the membrane with the 100% methanol. And once you decant the methanol, you can merge the membrane into a transfer buffer for additional 10 to 30 minutes. Okay. So that's how you can be able to, uh, you know, make the membrane so that it should be able to bind the proteins. Then in the step three, uh, you're going to do the assembly of the uh, transfer cassettes. So this is the assembly of the transfer cassettes. Uh, you can remove the stacking gel from the page and incubate the gel into the transfer buffer for 10 to 30 minutes. Place a pair of blotting sheets already saturated with the transfer buffer onto the anode plate. Usually it is a black color plate. So first you're going to be, keep the filter paper onto the anode plates. Then you place the membrane sheets, transfer membrane onto the blotting sheets and remove the trapped air by the rolling bulb, test tube or the glass bottles. So first you are going to put the filter papers, then you are going to put the nitrocellulose membrane, then you are going to put the gel, then again you are going to put another sheet of filter paper which is dipped in the transfer buffer and then you are going to put the cathodes and, by, and after this you are going to uh, tie this up and you are going to put the uh, turn on the electrophoresis. So finally you are going to keep the cathode plates and tighten the transfer cassette by the four screws and after this step you are going to add, uh, you are going to turn on the electrophoresis. So you are going to apply the constant voltage like for one hour. So after the transfer you disassemble the whole assembly and carefully remove the transfer membrane and check the protein transfer by the ponchu stain. Use a pencil paper and label the different lanes. For example, this is like so. Initially, you will since you will going to do a poncho stain, you are going to see the bands. So what you are going to do is you take the pencil and uh, you write like this is lane number one, lane number two, lane number three like this. That this pencil uh, uh, writing is going to remain there. You cannot use the mar prominent marker because the subsequent steps probably may uh, remove that. Uh, then in the step 4, you are going to do the blocking. So wash the membrane with distilled water to remove any remaining poncho stain. Put the membrane in blocking buffer containing 5% skim milk. If you are doing the western blotting for the uh, detecting of uh, phosphorylated protein, then you can use the BSA. Then step 5, you are going to do the probing. So in western blotting, probing can be done in two days, uh, two ways, right? Either you do a two-step probing or the one step probing. In the two step probing, a membrane is first probed with the primary antibody to recognize the protein of interest and then membrane is probed with the primary antibody with the approved dilution for one hour. Membrane is washed with the buffer containing non anti detergent Tritonex 100 and reprobed with the another antibody directed against the primary antibody. The secondary antibody is coupled with an enzyme or a fluorescent dye. The washed membrane is incubated with the secondary antibody with an appropriate dilution for one hour. Membrane is washed with a buffer containing non anti detergent and developed. Use of two antibodies increases the sensitivity as well as the giving the flexibility to plan the multiple probes. So you, if you use the two antibodies, first you are going to have the antigen like the, that is a protein of your interest and you are going to first probe that with the uh, primary antibodies. And then you are going to do the washing so that non-specific antibodies are going to remove and then you are going to put the secondary antibody and this secondary antibody is actually coupled to some enzyme so either it can be coupled to HRP or alkaline phosphatase and this HRP is actually going to give you the signal. Secondary antibody and why we do so two-step probing because the two-step probing is actually increasing the sensitivity. In a step one step probing, you can actually be able to add the primary antibody which contains the enzyme or you can use the fluorescent table for detection. One step probing is not very common, it's a two step probing but is very common. Uh, depending on the uh, uh, 
enzyme and as well as the different options you can actually be able to use the multiple ways to develop the blot and detect the protein present onto the membrane. Uh, you can use the chromogenic, for example, in the HRP based system, you can use the chromogenic substrate or you can use the luminescence substrate. So, for example, if you use, want to use the chromogenic substrate, which is actually going to give you the color, you can use the DAB or TMB. Uh, for alkaline phosphatase, you can use the BCIP and NBT system. Uh, if you want to use the luminescence as the readout, then in, for the HRP, you can use the luminol or H2O2 system. Whereas for the alkaline phosphatase, you can use the substituted 1,2 dioxane phosphate and it is actually going to give you the phosphorylated substrate gives the light. Similarly, in the luminol system, the luminol oxidation is going to give you the blue colored light. So, after that, you are going to do the colorometric detection. So, wash the membrane with TBS to remove the detergent, place the membrane into the colorometric reagent and protein band present in. Uh, appeared in 10 to 30 minutes. Stop the reaction by washing in distilled buffer, air dry the membrane and photograph for permanent record. If you want to do a chemiluminescent detection, the chemiluminescent detections are given in the table. Transfer the membrane into the chemiluminescent reagent, soak the membrane for 30 seconds for 2 to 5 minutes, drain off the reagent and wrap the membrane into plastic wrap. Uh, place it in a cassette and expose the membrane to a film for a few seconds for 4 hours. Flocent detections, you can do the secondary antibody la labeled with the flocent dye and that also can be used and then you can actually be able to signal, capture the signal in a uh, scanner. So, uh, to explain all these steps, uh, we have prepared a small demo and where the students are actually going to show you how you can be able to you know do the charging of the membrane how you can be able to assemble the cassettes to transfer the uh, bands from the sds page to the nitrocellulose membrane and so on hi everyone myself suram banish research scholar at department of biosciences and bioengineering iit Gawati. in this video we will demonstrate you how to do a western blot and uh, uh, how to analyze the result using ACL, Reprochemial Unicense Substrate. So here what we will do, we have to run gel first, then we will transfer. The transfer method, how to do the transfer, we will show in this video. In previous video, we have already shown that uh, how to run, how to prepare a SDS page gel and how to run protein samples. So in this video, particularly we are interested in uh, uh, factors associated with the western blotting. For doing western blot, we need membrane and uh, transfer buffer and uh, the transfer medium. Uh, this one is we used to transfer this gel to membrane. So here membrane can be two kind. One is nitrocellulose which has low uh, protein binding efficiency and the hydrophilic in nature. Another membrane is PVDF. This is hydrophobic membrane and uh, higher protein binding capacity. So the processing for uh, western blood is different from different for uh, nitrocellulose and PVDF. If you are using PVDF membrane, we have to take, we have to cut the part either if you have ready made uh, pre cut uh, pre cut blots then no need if you have if you are taking from a uh, bundle you have to cut precisely how many wells you want so after that you have to label front on the blot where that front side can be used for transferring the protein and that can be used in previous step uh, further steps also like uh, uh, antibody incubation. So here for uh, if you want to use PVDF membrane you have to charge with the methanol. So since the PVDF is a hydrophobic membrane you cannot directly uh, transfer the transfer in the aqueous medium. First you have to keep in uh, methanol for at least 20 minutes. So after this can be called as charging. So after this we will use that for uh, transfer. So this is pre-soaked in methanol and uh, equilibrated in uh, 
transfer buffer. So here while doing uh, uh, transfer, we need to consider few things. The buffer always should be in chilled condition. Otherwise, during this transfer at high voltage, it will generate high temperatures. So that may degrade your protein or decrease the efficiency of the transfer. That's why we need to keep the buffer always in chilled condition. And uh, let's start the procedure. So uh, we need a pre-run gel. So we already finished the gel running. In addition to that, we also need sponges which will give cushion to the uh, gel so that the gel may not uh, destroyed during the transfer. So, this is the cassette we will use for the uh, transfer. So, this is uh, negative side of cassette and this is the positive side. So, we are going to keep gel on negative side and positive side the blood uh, membrane. So, when we when we apply voltage from this side to this side, the negative protein it will be transferred, it will be moved to positive side, uh, positive side and it will be uh, captured in the uh, membrane. So first for doing that, these sponges we need to keep and also this uh, maybe give some uh, non-specific uh, binding to membrane. So what we will do, we will put blotting sheets on top of this. So after this, you have to remove air bubbles if any present. So once uh, you inserted the blotting sheet, then you have to keep your gel. So here we, we have to remember that gel after finishing the uh, SDS phase running, you have to keep in uh, transfer buffer so that it will give identical condition or equilibration kind of thing during transfer so that uh, protein transfer may be easy. So this is the gel. I am keeping on the negative side. So after that we have to overlay with the membrane. Next we have to remove any air bubbles if present. We have to overlay with another blotting sheet and remove the air bubbles. Each and every time when you introduce something you have to remove air bubbles. So this is the final sheet. So this is the positive side of the cassette, just have to keep like this, these are the screws, we have to tighten it up, then only the contact between the gel and the membrane will be sufficient to uh, get transferred. First you don't tight initially, you just keep and after that press the positive side of the cassette then tighten the screws. So all these things should be done in the transfer buffer only unless specified. So this is the chilled transfer buffer. Now we are going to do transfer. Pour sufficient buffer. And 
keep uh, this ice pack also if the chilling is not sufficient then uh, there may be heat generation so in order to prevent that we will use this ice pack so this will keep uh, the buffer cool till the transfer end of the transfer so uh, once that is over you directly take out the cassette and keep if there is a buffer insufficiency you can add on top of that make sure that uh, the cassette completely submerged so that the transfer will be proper and uh, there is no air bubbles so once the setup is over now you can transfer now transfer is going on. so how much voltage we need to give it depends on uh, uh, transfer to transfer it varies generally in our lab we will give at least uh, 2 hours of transfer at uh, 120 volts which is sufficient to uh, transfer even low molecular weight proteins also but uh, from instrument to instrument also it varies you needed to optimize before uh, doing uh, transfer after 2 hours we have to uh, remove the blood and uh, incubate with the uh, blacking buffer so we, i am going to stop here remove the cassette keep it in a tray remove the screws properly gently remove the sponges take out the blood and keep it in blacking buffer in this condition we have to keep if you are keeping it room temperature it is for 2 hours at least if you are keeping in 4 degrees celsius you can keep overnight the blocking buffer contains skim milk uh, or bsa along with the twin 20. the western blood transfer it all depends on the efficiency how precisely you are doing the transfer for example you should not use your bare hands while handling the blood or uh, gel so whatever the proteins present on uh, your fingers it will transfer into uh, gel or membrane which will give high background during development of the blood so always use gloves apart from that uh, while handling the instrument to make sure that there may be possibility of uh, 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 electricity the shock uh, may happen sometime so we have to that time also we need to use gloves and after uh, finishing uh, finishing the transfer you have to clean all the apparatus properly and dry it for the next time use after the blocking of the membrane we have to remove the membrane and incubate with the primary antibody without washing the main purpose of the blocking is that it will occupy non-specific sites other than the respective protein so that when antibody comes it will bind to that specific protein and gives no nice so after this we will incubate with the primary antibody for uh, overnight at 4 degrees celsius then wash 3 times at least 15 minutes each with the uh, TBST buffer or PBST buffer and uh, again treat with incubate with the secondary antibody suitable secondary antibody for uh, 5 hours at 4 degrees celsius or 2 hours at uh, 3 hours at room temperature after that we need to wash properly at least 3 times then we will develop with the develop the blood with the electrochemical lubricant 
substrate. In earlier uh, Western blood, how to do Western blood video, we showed how to transfer the proteins to uh, membrane. So uh, we are we incubated with the uh, primary antibody, following secondary antibody, and wash with the. Now here we show how to develop a blood. For developing a blood, we need chemiluminescent substrate. In most of the commercially available kits, luminal is the one of the substrate we use for this purpose. So luminal in presence of hydrogen peroxide and uh, peroxidase engine which present in the uh, secondary antibody uh, horse radius peroxidase conjugated secondary antibody this horse radius peroxidase converts luminal to excited state luminal by deprotonating and oxidizing it so this product uh, this excited state product gradually uh, leaves the energy by releasing uh, luminescent photons. That light will be detected using this instrument. So, uh, these are the commercially available uh, chemiluminescent substrate uh, solutions. So, it is available from a wide range of companies. We have to mix 1 is to 1 ratio. So, we have to uh, take out the blood. Drain the buffer, whatever present, properly. So after that, you keep blood in between uh, a plastic paper foils. Then we will take chemiluminescent substrate So after that, after slowly press and remove air bubbles this is the tray we use it for uh, developing the blood so we have to open the system properly align the uh, tray and then shift blood to The tail. Once it is over, you have to just close. Here we have to select application. We want blasts that is chemiluminescent and uh, what exposure want. You have two options manual, auto. Auto in auto, two options are there optimal auto exposure, rapid auto exposure. We will choose optimal auto exposure. So you can uh, enlarge the uh, blood also. Once it is over, you just say. So this is the developed blood. So as we can see uh, the bands, the bands pattern. So this is how we develop Western blood uh, through electrochemiluminescent substrate. So in this video, we demonstrated how to transfer uh, proteins to a blood and what are the precautions need to be taken while doing the western blood and also how to develop the blood and what is the laying principle behind the developing the blood. So I hope this will help you to understand the uh, basic outline mechanism of how western blood works. Thanks for watching. So in the demo, uh, students have explained the different steps and I hope the demo video could be helpful for you to understand the practical aspect of the same uh, Western blotting. 
and it will help you to perform the experiment in your laboratory. So uh, what we have discussed, we have discussed about the expression of the protein utilizing the mammalian expression system. And uh, in that, you can have the two options. Either you can have the transient expression system or the permanent expression system. And both of these uh, options have their own positives and negatives. And apart from that, you can also have the option of non-constitutive uh, expression or the inducible expression system. And uh, so, based on the different types of requirements and as well as the criteria, you can have the choice of choosing the uh, different conditions for expressing the protein into the mammalian expression system. And once you are going to express the protein of your interest, you can also should perform the specific test like the western blotting to detect the protein on the uh, nitrocellulose membrane. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent uh, uh, lectures, we are going to discuss about the protein product, protein purifications so that you can be able to isolate the enzyme of your interest from the crude life state. Thank you.